Hello, and welcome to Up Close with Jose Andres. I'm Nelson Cunningham. I'm a member of the NAFSA Board of Directors and president and co-founder of McClarty Associates, a global strategic advisory firm here in Washington, D.C. It's my honor and pleasure today to sit down with Jose Andres, an internationally recognized culinary innovator, author, and committed advocate for anti-hunger issues. Jose founded World Central Kitchen after the devastating 2010 earthquake in Haiti with the belief that food can be an agent of change. Since then, World Central Kitchen has supported humanitarian efforts in Brazil, Cambodia, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Zambia, and the United States. Jose and World Central Kitchen are committed to promoting health, education, and social enterprise across the globe. His humanitarian work has led Jose to be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and he has been twice named to Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People list. Jose was most recently chosen as the James Beard Foundation's Humanitarian of the Year. Jose, it's a real pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And luckily for me, it's not the first time that we've met. In fact, I've had the pleasure of eating not just in your restaurants, but in your own kitchen. One day, I was going with some friends out to dinner, was told that one of their dear friends, Jose Andres, would be joining us. As I was heading to the restaurant, I got the phone call, no, we're going to Jose's house. He's decided to cook for us. We went to his house and I got to watch Jose wander around his kitchen, deciding what to throw together for an impromptu meal. He found a frozen roast suck, he found a frozen suckling pig in the freezer. He pulled out fresh peas. He turned on the pizza oven in his back garden and got it heating. He threw in the roast suckling pig. He provided some cheese and some wine from somewhere in his basement. Uh, three or four hours later, we all rolled out of the house, having had a personally prepared Jose Andres dinner with his beautiful wife and lovely daughter sitting there with us. Uh, what a wonderful way to get to know you. And I'm delighted to introduce you to our audience as well. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, that's uh, what we are, no? Uh, I'm a very lucky boy that um, uh, on paper, what people will call my profession, which is feeding people, is also my favorite hobby. Okay. And so when I'm, when I'm uh, at work, I'm not really at work, I'm having fun. And I do believe that always, and I know it's professions that maybe they don't look uh, maybe so charming as cooking, but cooking also has a lot of hardships. We need always to find a way to provide uh, uh, the people the opportunity. That's a matter of what they do. Um, this kind of possibility to really feel that they are not going to work, but that really they are providing very uh, important services for the benefit of all. And we need to find ways always where everybody can be enjoying themselves. That's a matter of what you're doing. So you became a chef because you loved cooking and loved being with people. How did you go f and become a humanitarian? <laughs> the, I don't see myself really as a humanitarian. I only see myself as following the footsteps of many people before me, uh, millions of people before me, but many people have been able to see that beyond their work, beyond their duty, they always found time to give themselves to improve the lives of others. My mom, my dad, they were nurses. Um, every time I went to the hospital, and was often, uh, I saw those men and women in the hospitals going beyond their duty. Maybe reading a book to a child that was alone or walking an elderly person. Um, so. It, uh, the person could do some sport. To me, those are things that they were beyond their duty. Um, I've seen multiple times people uh, just put in uh, the best of themselves, not to, to improve their lives, but to improve the lives of others. And for me, uh, realizing that uh, my same two hands and my know-how and how to feed the few could be put to the service of feeding the many, it's something like became kind of a mission in life, very natural. Uh, but again, it's so much you you can do that always you feel like you are not successful enough. 
but I do believe um, use the the mere thought of trying to do it, of thinking about doing it. Um, and that's a matter if you're helping the person next to you, or you are able to have a bigger input in the world. I, I do believe that that's just enough. And everybody, if everybody does a little bit, uh, the world can be so much better. So for me, I'm only doing my little part, um, trying to help people I feel it's, uh, it's are in need of a play. It's an important part. As you know, NAFSA is dedicated to promoting student exchange, allowing students from one country to travel to another, study there, learn the culture. You came to America as a young man. Uh, what advice would you give a young student of how to use food and food culture uh, to understand the country in which he or she is living? Well, uh, as a father, I just had my um, older daughter, Carlota. Um, she born in the States, uh, even she shares a love for both countries, the country where I come from and my wife, Spain, and the country she was born and she belongs, uh, America. And for her, her dream was to study abroad and she went to Spain. Even she knows the country was, she never experienced the country beyond vacation and she wanted to live like one more person. So I've seen in, in first hand how important it is um, to go um, away from your comfort zone. I always tell, especially children and young, young people, that the best can happen in their lives is when they move away from their comfort zone. I do believe that society is uh, trying always to provide for, for the people you know, and uh, it's a way of uh, trying to protect everybody from the dangers that may be out there. And we forget sometimes that the ways, the best way to be protecting our children, which is sometimes what we care for the most, is not by building a wall around them, but actually to show them the world they live in. By them understanding the world they live in uh, is the way we're protecting them better because then they can see that they are maybe having a great life compared to others. Even if sometimes we keep complaining about what we don't have versus what others don't have. And in the moment you are able to show them the uh, world wide open, is the moment the real things began happening. Yeah. They are more appreciative of what they have, and they began having an understanding that maybe they have to be working uh, harder to provide for others uh, that don't have half of what they enjoy. I do believe that should be the new American dream. I think that should be the new way for humanity. Not only look for your own, but seeing that the way for you to protect your own is by making sure everybody else is doing fine. Now, you, you have been an advocate for immigrants in this country, especially for the dreamers. Uh, many, of our, many of our members here at NAFSA, 10,000 here in Washington gathered for the conference, they'll go back to their communities, uh, their universities, the towns where they live. What can they do to help the plight of the dreamers, to help promote immigrant rights and the openness for our society? Well, I think uh, what America is facing right now at the beginning of the 21st century is uh, fascinating, and to me it's an opportunity. I always say that immigration and immigration reform is not a problem for America or for the world to solve. It's an opportunity for America and the world to seize. Why? Immigrants are this amazing bridge that bring different points of view and enrich uh, the communities where they arrived. Obviously, uh, maybe that sometimes we live in this world that they teach us to be afraid of those that don't speak like us, don't look like us, people that maybe have different religions or color of skin. Uh, sometimes nobody is doing it in a bad way, but happens that we kind of generate this protection. Immigrants in this DNA age we are living are going to be uh, a very important group of individuals in America and across the world. That's why it's so important that immigration reform in America happens. Why? Because this is a country of immigrants. With putting aside the native Indian Americans, Everybody else, as far as I know, and believe me, I'm from Spain. We studied this from the moment almost we began, <laughs> we born. Uh, we were the first people to arrive to America. And so you could argue that during 500 years, only been people arriving from different parts of the world to the United States. 
this is a country that, if anything, embraces immigration like no other. That's why immigration reform needs to happen, needs to happen soon. These million dreamers we have, the amount of money that it costs to train million people that now be are American as any American, um, is just an amazing opportunity that we cannot waste. 11 million undocumented. Without them, our Congress wouldn't be eating salads because those salads are probably picked by those same undocumented. The Republicans and Democrats alike in different moments in the last 20 years, they didn't want to provide a true immigration reform to give them the opportunity to belong. In the process, this nation keep moving forward. It's so many things. Uh, so um, immigration, I hope that our politicians don't let America down, because I know what America wants. America wants that everybody that is part of the American dream is recognized. We didn't fought, fought civil wars, and, and we didn't fought for slavery and human rights, for then having over 11 million people that are here like ghosts of the system. The system wouldn't move without them, but somehow we don't want finally to recognize that they belong to America as much as you and I. So again, immigration is a big opportunity that we cannot let pass any longer. You know, I love the I love the fact that you brought it around to food. Who picks your lettuce? Who eats your lettuce? Um, I understand that, uh, of course, NAFSA is all about the the uh, bringing cultures together and creating understanding across cultures. And food is one of the essential ways that cultures can understand each other. Um, I understand that when you were a young chef. And it just opened your uh, Hallmark restaurant here in Washington, Haleo. One of your regular dinner guests was Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was one of the lions of the U.S. Senate. And you and he would sit there and eat together and talk. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, he was more a, a bar guy like me, <laughs> uh, Irish, but uh, he would always be waiting uh, for his uh, wife, uh, or friends, and, uh, and I, w I had the privilege, really, yeah. to spend uh, good times. And at one moment, of many amazing phrases he always told me was like, if in America, who say an immigrant like you, if you were hard, uh, America, and you love America, America will always uh, welcome and love you back. Yeah. Uh, at the end, it's not so, so, so difficult for me, as we've been mentioning, uh, food and education. I'm a person that probably didn't receive uh, proper education in the sense of the world. Even today, I'm, I'm very humbled to say that I helped teach physics through cooking at Harvard, or we try to we teach a class at George Washington about how food very much touches every single thing from history to physics, to science, to immigration, to politics, public policy, health. Food is very much at the heart of where we are. I always say that, yes, food is an amazing way not to teach people, because when you say the word teach, it seems almost you are lecturing. But this new way of learning that in the 21st century we are enjoying, that you can be learning only if you are out there with the willingness to learn. And for me, I had always amazing teachers in my life, professional teachers and what I call life teachers. At the end, I, rem I, I remind myself that I'm only as good as those people that around me try to share with me what they knew. Okay. So for me, this fascination about always trying, uh, in a moment that sometimes they ask me to talk, when I enjoy so much being silent, because I'm about to be 50 and I just realize that I know nothing. In cooking, more I know about the Spanish cooking, every day I realize that I know almost nothing. Like it's so much more that I am missing. That's why I love to collect all cookbooks because an old book sometimes, especially a cookbook, is an amazing window into a not distant past that actually gives me the clues of who I am today. Today I am many things. I'm not the Spanish anymore. I've been falling in love learning about American cooking. In the process of learning about American cooking, I do believe I've been learning what America is. So one plate of food, we shouldn't look at it anymore as something is bringing us calories or is nourishing us, uh, our body, but it's so much more. A plate of food, it's a way of uh, democracy. You can vote with your, with your plate. You can be learning about the region you are. You can be learning about the farming policies of the country you live. You can be learning about are we treating our immigrant population right or not. Uh, why is meat sometimes cheaper than green beans? Why subsidizing one but not 
no subsidizing the other. All of a sudden, a plate of food is just an amazing way to ask yourself uh, who I am. Briat Sabran, the French philosopher in 1926, said, uh, tell me what you eat and I will tell you who you are. Uh, and that's a phrase that ha has uh, a big value and we need to take it, take it seriously. When you go overseas, and as I mentioned earlier, you've, you've run kitchens in, in, in Zambia and Nicaragua, other, so many other countries. How do you involve the young people in the places where you go? Because I, I can see you would use that as a teaching experience for them. Well, uh, I, don't, I, I don't involve them. They involve themselves. Um, sometimes uh, living, it only means that you're creating um, the base to give an option to everybody to join. Um, and we forget that democracy to a degree has to be that, to make sure that the people in charge of maintaining that democracy play by the rules and creating a level field that then everybody wants to be engaged. Well, sometimes we say that the young people are not engaged in democracies because maybe they don't like what they see and they rather prefer be on the side. So what we do in those moments that there is darkness, that there is no hope, that there seems everything is uh, very confusing chaos, Children sometimes are the ones that see things very, very clear. When sometimes the grown-ups are in the big convention centers trying to strategize about how to provide relief, uh, you go to a neighborhood and without telling anything to the children, they see you're providing food and water and you are coming every day. All of a sudden, they're waiting for you there because they know more or less you show up on time. And before you know, they're telling you who are the elderly that need food. You see, that's a very simple uh, problem, but actually in a very magical way, we had always those children, for example, in Puerto Rico, in different towns, we were delivering food in more than 935 places a day. Many of them were neighborhoods. Children were always there next to our food trucks or pickup trucks on our teams. And before they even ate, they were very much giving us insight, intelligence, information about where the elderly live, who needed help, who, did, he, who couldn't move because he was handicapped. And all of a sudden, we never told them, we need a list of who needs food. All of a sudden, this will come naturally on them. So as you see, when the moment you provide the ground rules uh, in a very simple way, children use our magicians with that, and they are even to multiply it. So children for us has been always an amazing experience in the way of of having them uh, involved, but they involve themselves. We're not there telling them we need you or they realize that they are needed and they wanna be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's remarkable how you bring them in, how you bring them into your work, how they bring themselves into your work. Uh, you've already given in your own family the gift of two cultures, Spain and the United States. Um, if you were advising your own family or others, what, where, what part of the world would you advise them to go out and study abroad? What cultures do you believe are the ones that we as Americans today need to be understanding better? I think we should all try always to be as further away from the cultures uh, are more like ours. Um, so go someplace different, go someplace For example, different. for good or for bad, uh, I'm, a, I'm a person of faith but uh, I don't make faith what uh, um, defines me on the open. It's something I live more internal. Uh, because in the moment you use uh, faith as pure religion, and we know um, some of the biggest conflicts we ever had, somehow they had to be because defending that faith or because some people thought that the faith of others was the wrong one. Uh, I don't think that's the way, and I don't think faith was great in the first place for that. But somehow humans, we transform it as a weapon of mass destruction or the reason why to fight for something is not very clear what. So I will tell you, go to a, whatever faith you grow up, go to a country that has completely the opposing, all their different faith. If you are a, a Christian, you go to a Muslim country. And if you are Jewish, you go to a pure uh, 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 Christian country. I, just mix. Uh, some of the best experiences in my house is when we celebrate uh, certain um, uh, moments with friends that are from other religions. Uh, they come to our uh, Catholic celebrations, we go to their Jewish celebrations. Um, um, that's, to me, one of the most powerful moments. So I will always recommend people just move away, as I said before, of your comfort zone. 
and go to a place that all of a sudden, um, because the movies and because what we hear on TV, even our president lately, uh, that seems that somebody because it's a, it's a Muslim uh, and because we see in, in, in the TVs that in the moment you see a mosque, and you see somebody call a call to prayer, all of a sudden they must be terrorists. It's almost, if nobody even says it, TV, movies, it seems everything, the predisposition, that's something wrong. Well, we went last year to Jordan. We spent almost three weeks there traveling around Jordan. And to me, one of the most beautiful moments of the day was the call to prayer uh, uh, from the from the minarets, from the towers in the mosque. All of a sudden, something that like looks strange and dark and different, all of a sudden is beautiful and a, a moment of respect. And all of a sudden you began thinking, hold on a second, hold on a second. I grew up in a little town when the bells began uh, a beautiful sound in the moment the, and the priest was ready for mass. So hold on a second, are you telling me that the bells in the middle of the little church are the same as their call to prayer from the minaret? Actually, it's the same thing. You just do it in different way. But we all do the same. Let's gather together in this sacred place and let's, for one hour, pay respect to our faith. Wow, that shouldn't be something we should be celebrating and be happy that other people around the world have the same values as us. We have to move away from people try to make us different and so bring us kind of to war and you show that we are much more equal than not. Jose, thank you so much for letting us understand how you think, how you think about food, why you do what you do, why you think so much about other cultures, other societies, and thanks for sharing some time with us here at NAFSA. What a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.